So to better understand sacral dysfunction, we're gonna uh, start by discussing our normal or expected sacral motions uh, to add some context uh, so we can better understand it. So in terms of um, the first type of motion we're gonna talk about uh, is gonna be postural motion. So uh, in normal posture, so related to normal uh, forward bending or back bending or lumbar flexion or lumbar extension, we would expect the sacrum to flex and extend um, either forward or backward, so anteriorly or posteriorly on a transverse axis. So with lumbar flexion, we would expect with that uh, lumbar spine flexing forward for relatively the sacrum to uh, rotate posteriorly. So with lumbar flexion, we would expect um, sacral extension. With lumbar extension, we would expect also uh, sacral flexion uh, in, in, in tandem. Uh, the next type of motion we're going to talk about is uh, respiratory motion. So when you breathe, or uh, when human beings breathe, um, the sacrum is going to move uh, in also in flexion and extension, very similarly to postural motion, but uh, the relationship of those motions is going to be a little bit different. So with inhalation, we'd expect the sacral base to move posteriorly, so extension with inhalation, and then with exhalation, we'd expect uh, the sacral base to move anteriorly or into flexion uh, with inhalation. So that's going to be extension with inhalation and flexion with exhalation, both of which uh, occur on a transverse axis. The next type of motion we're going to talk about is uh, dynamic motion. So uh, during the gait cycle, um, oblique axes are engaged. Um, and uh, so, for example, when you uh, step forward on your right side, you plant, uh, your, you plant on your left side and um, the force generated through you planting on your left side uh, locks the left oblique axis. And as you step forward on your right hand side, your uh, right sacral base is gonna move anteriorly. So normally with uh, stepping forward on the right side, you would end up with your sacrum rotating to the left on a left axis, so a left on left motion of the sacrum. When you then plant on your right side, you engage the right oblique axis, and then your sacrum is going to move uh, or rotate to the right on a right oblique axis. Uh, the last type of motion, which is um, not as uh, related here, and we'll discuss uh, more in a future uh, session, uh, is inherent motion of the sacrum as it's related to uh, the relationship between the cranium and the sacrum and the dural attachments between. So with uh, craniosacral flexion, uh, we would expect um, the sacral base to move posteriorly, so into extension. And with craniosacral extension, we would expect the sacrum to move anteriorly, so into flexion. But to avoid any kind of uh, confusion, we refer to uh, sacral flexion and extension a little bit differently in this context. Uh, with an anterior sacral base uh, or with rotation anteriorly of the sacrum, we would call that uh, nutation. And with rotation posteriorly, we would call that counter nutation. So with craniosacral flexion, we uh, will find counter nutation. And with craniosacral extension, we would find uh, nutation. Now that we've talked about our uh, normal motions of the sacrum, let's talk about some uh, dysfunctions and hopefully that helps to clarify uh, what motions and expected findings we would have. So first example we're gonna use is sacral torsions. So in sacral torsions, uh, what we would find, and we're gonna use a uh, right on right sacral torsion as an example, we would expect the sacrum to rotate towards the right, so the front of the sacrum rotating to the right on a right axis. So rotation to the right on a right axis. Um, we would also expect L5 to rotate uh, in the opposite direction. So as uh, the sacrum is rotating to the right on that right axis, we expect L5 to rotate to the left. So how is that going to um, correlate with our exam findings? On exam, we would expect for there to be a positive C deflection test on the left we expect a deep sulcus on the left-hand side, a posterior ILA on the right, uh, which would be um, engaging a right oblique axis. We would also expect 
uh, L5 to be rotated to the left. We would expect also a lumbosacral spring test to be negative because we have an anterior sacral base. And we also expect to uh, have a sphinx test that would be negative as well for the same reason. Uh, now talking about posterior type sacral torsions, uh, we're gonna use a right on left sacral torsion as an example. We would expect for the sacrum again to rotate to the right on a now left axis. Um, and L5, we would expect to rotate to the left. So uh, how would that relate to our exam findings? In this instance, uh, because we have that left axis, left oblique axis, um, we would have a positive seat flexion test on the right, a shallow sulcus on the right, an anterior ILA on the left. L5 would be rotated to the left. Our spring test would be positive and our sphinx test would also be positive because we have a posterior sacral base. The next type of dysfunction we're gonna talk about is uh, similar to our torsions, it's our rotations. So in terms of our uh, deep and shallow sul uh, sulci and um, oblique axes, they're gonna be very similar. The main difference is our rotation of L5 uh, as, rela as related to the rotation of the sacrum. So uh, for an example of a left on left sacral rotation, we would have um, a positive seat flexion test on the right, a deep sulcus on the right as well, and we would have a left oblique axis and a posterior ILA on the uh, left, uh, suggesting that left rotation on that left axis, and our L5 would be rotating also to the left. For a um, right on left rotation, which is more of a posterior type rotation, we would have a C deflection test positive on the right, uh, which um, would suggest our oblique axis on the left-hand side. We'd have a shallow sulcus on the right, a, an anterior ILA on the left. And with our right uh, rotation on that uh, left axis, we would also have a rotation of L5 to the right for our right on left rotation. So the next somatic dysfunction we're going to talk about for the sacrum is um, bilateral dysfunctions. So uh, we have two types of bilateral dysfunctions. There's bilateral sacral flexions and bilateral sacral extensions. So in this instance, uh, we're expecting the sacrum to move either anteriorly or posteriorly on that same postural axis that we were talking about before, um, but you're gonna have a restriction in motion one direction or the other. So for bilateral sacral flexion, you'd expect the sacrum to rotate anteriorly, symmetrically, and for bilateral sacral extension, you'd expect uh, the sacrum to rotate posteriorly, symmetrically. So what are the findings that we're gonna have? For a bilateral sacral flexion, our C deflection test is going to be symmetric. It's not actually gonna have any kind of laterality. It's gonna be symmetric. But what we are gonna find is we're gonna find our, our sacral sulci are gonna be bilaterally deep, and our ILAs are gonna be bilaterally posterior. Our uh, lumbosacral uh, spring test is going to be negative, and our uh, sphinx test is going to be um, also equivocal because nothing is gonna change. Nothing was asymmetric to begin with, um, so nothing is gonna change. For a bilateral sacral extension, we would expect, again, our C-deflection test to be uh, equivocal, so um, negative on both sides or symmetric, and uh, we would expect our sacral sulci to be bilaterally shallow. We'd expect our ILAs to be um, bilaterally anterior. Our spring test in this instance is going to be positive but our sphinx test is also going to be negative because there was no, or equivocal, because there was no asymmetry to begin with. So with uh, lumbar extension and, uh, and uh, sacral flexion, we're not gonna really see any change in terms of symmetry. So the next sacral dysfunction we're gonna talk about is uh, sacral shear type dysfunctions. So the two types of dysfunctions we have 
are unilateral sacral flexions and unilateral sacral extensions. So I'm going to talk about a right unilateral sacral flexion for the sake of, a, of an example. So with a right unilateral sacral flexion, because the sacrum does not live on its own and always lives in the context of the anominate, what's happening is um, the sacrum is shearing anteriorly and inferiorly. Um, as a result, what we're going to see is a deep sulcus on that side and a posterior ILA on that same side. Um, we're not going to be really considering or engaging oblique axes. We don't really have normal flexion extension uh, axes being engaged. Instead, what we're going to end up with is, uh, in terms of our exam findings, we're going to end up with a C deflection test that's going to be positive on the right, a deep sulcus that's going to be on the right, a posterior ILA on that right side, a spring test that's going to be negative, and a sphinx test that's going to be negative. In the case of a unilateral sacral extension, um, so we're going to use a right unilateral sacral extension as our example, uh, we would expect very much the opposite. So the sacrum has, in the context of the anominate, sacrum has sheared posteriorly and superiorly. So it's shearing in this direction. As a result, we're going to have a positive seal flexion test on that right side. We're going to have a shallow sulcus on that side, a, an anterior ILA on that same side. In this instance, we're going to have a positive spring test and a positive sphinx test uh, because we have a uh, posterior sacral base on that side.